for Krima Media's policy, I'm Tabi Madiba. Joining me today is Leon Vessels. Leon was one of the key members of the former National Party who in the 1990s negotiated South Africa's political settlement and new constitution with the ANC and other parties. Leon is the author of a recent book on the political struggles that led to the first democratic election in South Africa in 1994. His book is titled Encountering Apartheid's Ghost from Kukasdorp to Constitutional Hill. As a former deputy chairperson of the body that helped to draft South Africa's constitution, can you give us some sense on the key forces of play in shaping the constitution and how did South Africa move from apartheid to a human rights-based constitution? There are two, two elements uh, to your question. The first, the first element I want to, to tackle is the fact that uh, South Africa has a long history of struggle. It started way before uh, the so-called South African War or the Anglo-Boer War. It was a point of focus when the peace treaty was signed in Vereniging between uh, the Boer republics and, and the British Empire in 1902. Because as, le- as Nelson Mandela years later would remark, that that was where the African people of South Africa first experienced the betrayal of the British and the Boers. Or as other historians had put it, all South Africans, regardless of skin pigmentation or political loyalties, were humiliated during that war and at that peace negotiation. But really at the heart of it was exclusion. And when the constitution was finally signed on the 10th of December, 1996, so many years later, Nelson Mandela said that we now have the inclusivity that we were denied in 1902. Now that date is important because after five years of negotiation, the constitution was signed on the 10th of December, 1996. But it was signed on the date that the General Assembly of the United Nations, namely the 10th of December, 1948, had agreed to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So after five years of negotiation and donkey's years of of struggle, South Africa at that moment signaled to the world that we were now in step with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You have said that this was a journey you would not have missed for anything in the world. So tell us on a personal level how you reflect on the process and on your participation in the drafting of the constitution? I'm not claiming that, that, uh, that I was a central figure, but I will claim that I was someone who had a, a ringside seat when all these important decisions were taken, in particular those five years of, of negotiation since uh, negotiations started in December 1991, and then when the constitution was signed in 1996. It was an incredible, exciting journey. For, for many years, South Africa had been in struggle or been fighting one another. It was an eye for an eye, a battle. And during those five years, it was eye to eye negotiations, meeting all the South Africans that you only knew by name, sitting around the same negotiating table as Nelson Mandela, Chris Hani, Joe Slovo, and many others, was a life's experience uh, never to be forgotten. And Leon, when did you first get involved in politics and what was the route that took you to be Deputy Chairperson of South Africa's constitution making process in the 1990s? I think it's fair to say that that I was a very boring student when I entered uh, 
my my student career i i knew of the political issues at stake i was alive to them but i wanted to be a lawyer and uh, i wanted to focus on my studies uh, i i enjoyed the classes uh, and the lectures i loved the the lecturers i loved the interaction with fellow students but but after a year of two at university, uh, the politics of South Africa and student politics just got hold of me to the extent that I neglected my studies. And I wasn't a so-called career politician at university, but politics there and then became very important suddenly in my life. I, I just realized I could not only be a spectator and that politics is not a spectator sport. So I became a student leader and in that capacity I was very fortunate to meet people across the political divide, so to speak. Young people, my generation. I met uh, Uncle Pozzo Tiro and uh, I venture to say that, that we enjoyed each other's company the, the two or three times that, that we actually met. And Tiro instilled in me the sense that we would have to sit around a table and find a solution for South Africa's problems. This was in the early 70s. Politicians didn't really inspire me at, at that juncture. I was more inspired, inspired by my interactions with Abram Tiro and, and, and lecturers. I remember clearly that Professor Marinus Wichers, who was, a, who was a very important lecturer in the field of law, constitutional law in particular, said that there are many unanswered questions in South Africa's political life and that my generation of students would have to find the answers for those questions. Unbeknown to him and unaware of the fact what Avram Tiro had told me, he said the very same thing, namely that the days of you, white Afrikaner students, grappling with these issues on your own, you would have to find solutions with others. In other words, echoing the sentiments of Avram Tiro saying that we would have to sit around a negotiating table and find a solution. I would say that those two um, interactions uh, really triggered my uh, and launched my political career in a strange way. I wasn't a member as I explained of political parties, I wasn't an activist and I met F.W. de Klerk, who was a young backbencher at that time, and said, you know, we need young people in politics. And little did I know that so many years later, he would invite me to serve in his cabinet. So the, those three uh, interactions with those three individuals really sparked, uh, I wouldn't say my appetite for politics, but launched me into politics. And the National Party led by F.W. Duterte withdrew from the government of the National Unity on 30th June 1996. Do you think this was a correct decision? And later the National Party merged with the ANC. So what is your view of that decision? Well, it's two, it, it's once again, Tabi, two uh, very important uh, questions. The first one, I don't want to refer to F.W. de Klerk in any derogatory sense because he, he has a place in history, but that decision to leave uh, the government of national unity was fatal. For years, for years and years, he had advocated uh, the idea of power sharing and working together and unity in diversity, uh, all those buzzwords were bandied about when the opportunity came to, uh, to give effect 
to those concepts for a, a reason still not fully understood by me he walked away of that arrangement and in many respects uh, failed uh, south africa and failed the national party as such now your second question of the national party uh, joining the anc uh, at that juncture i was a lawyer again politics is a very very excuse the word is a very jealous mistress it 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 it, it calls for your attention all the time and i was um, i was liberated so to speak and to to return to to law and and my legal practice which i love and i was at that stage a mere observer i didn't uh, have any quarrels with the leadership at that time when they joined forces uh, with the anc so uh, once again it was not my battle but i didn't uh, object to it and leon in many years ago you made a speech in bloemfontein about law and order situation in the country for which p W. Botha instructed F. W. de Klerk to reprimand you. So can you tell us about that incident? It was as clear as daylight to me that you cannot rule a country through emergency regulations, through security uh, legislation, and, and, and by force. You, you can only govern if there is a consensus and voluntary consensus as such by the citizens. And there was no way that the National Party could continue governing this country as a minority government. So it was clear to me that the security forces had played their part, but it was now over the, to the politicians to find a solution. And once again, I'm latching on to the statements made by Uncle Pozzo Tiro, by Marina Zwickers, and even by uh, F.W. de Klerk. Now, there were people, and I'm still guessing who they were, made mischief and whispered in P.W.'s ear that these people, myself and Venant Malan at the time, were out of line, out of tune of the National Party thinking. But as strange as it may seem, uh, for an outsider, once, Vainant Malan and I had this discussion, or during the discussion with, with PW, it, it became clear to me that he didn't have all the facts of what we were saying. And in many ways, he agreed with us on that day and, and even afterwards, that finding a solution was in the hands of the politicians and the statesmen and women in this country and not in the security forces. And it was a pivotal moment. It was a moment of, of excitement when, when you actually confronted with a hard reality that, that your elders are agreeing with, with your sentiments. And Leon, in Krukasdorp and Mansaville issue in the mid-1980s, you pleaded for the peaceful removal of the Mansaville township to an area with better living conditions in Kahiso. Tell us more about that era. When I joined uh, Parliament as a member of the National Party, many, many uh, discussions had already taken place that Manziville, the township Manziville, would be removed to Kahisu. So I think it's fair to say that that was a policy I inherited. I did not object to that. That's the way it was. To my understanding, that removal was going to take place peacefully and it was going to take place almost by, by agreement. But when it was resisted by the community of Manzival and the manner in which I had uh, interacted with many members of that, that community, it became clear to me that uh, 
that was not going to, to happen at all. It's not going to happen peacefully and it's not going to happen by agreement. And at that juncture, it also became clear to me and others and also to P.W. Buerta that we had reached the end of the journey of so-called forced force removals. And, and once all of this dawned on me, in other words, the community members of Manzibal and also activists such as Desmond Tutu uh, and others convinced me that this was the end of the journey. And once we agreed that we had reached the end of forced removals, it was almost the beginning of the end of the National Party policy regarding urbanization, regarding homeland development, everything. And, and there was only one solution to, to our challenges, namely that South Africa was one undivided country with one citizenship. And you had many encounters with Nelson Mandela from the time he was released from prison in 1990 to his election and inauguration in 1994 and beyond. So what are your memories of the interactions you had with Nelson Mandela? Well, one has to be very modest when you speak about Nelson Mandela and, and you must be careful not to portray your interactions with him as, as if you were the favorite uh, son in all of this. So I am speaking in a very toned down language and voice when I speak about Nelson Mandela. And I speak in a very uh, humane manner, but in doing so, I want to uh, just cite two little examples which are not often well known. When we first met, Tersha was, was with me. And Nelson Mandela, uh, in a very polite manner, brushed me aside and introduced himself to Tersha, not allowing me to introduce Tersha to him. And he said, ah, now I see why you are such a confident young man. You are so confident because you have this lovely lady to support you, which was typical of, of Nelson Mandela, the human being. There was another, another occasion. There was a small, very small news clip about me being appointed uh, as an honorary professor at the University of the Northwest that I was now to, to lecture there as a professor. It was a very tiny news uh, article, but it was not so small that Nelson Mandela did not realize or that this was a very important moment in my life. So Mandela called me on that occasion and he said, oh, I see you are now a very important man. You are now a professor. I'm calling to congratulate you, but I'm also calling to ask that you must not forget your old friends. And that was typical of Nelson Mandela. He was a larger than life figure and he really cared for everyone, all the citizens uh, of this country. And appearing before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, Leon, you said that the fact that it had subsequently been revealed that there were extrajudicial killings and torture perpetuated by some security force members was a great shock to you and a matter of sadness and regret. So do you think you should have done more to become aware of and expose the extrajudicial activities and violence? Violence, uh, extrajudicial killings, were there for all of us to see it was in the public domain it was in the international domain it was raised in parliament by opposition politicians such as helen susman but given the facts at, at, at my disposal as i put it in front of the 
TRC, I only whispered about, <laughs> about them. I, I, I didn't shout from the rooftops, and one may argue that I could have and should have uh, shouted much harder, but those facts, the hard facts to, uh, to, to dispute what, what the rumors and, 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 was, and was out there, was difficult to prove. So in, 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 in many respects, I was what Professor um, Sol de Bow later said, that I understood the complexity of complicity. It was a major challenge. And the sadness uh, of it all was that, that we had claimed that we were in charge of uh, governing the country, we were in charge of the policy directions of the security forces, and yet uh, the, when a light was shone on the facts, we realized that we fell short. Many people still dispute that we fall short, but, but I, I, I acknowledge that without fear for contradiction. And do you see the importance of prosecuting apartheid era crimes in the country? I agree with the, with the sentiment that there should be, there should be uh, prosecutions. And the reason why there should be prosecutions is the simple notion that all of us want to live under the law. And that can only happen if no one is above the law. So, uh, we cannot, on the one hand, shout prosecute people fingered by Justice Zondo in the so-called State Capture Commission, and then on the other hand, say, don't prosecute apartheid crimes. It doesn't make sense. So to live under the law, no one must be allowed to live above the law. And lastly, Leon, do you think solutions will be found in the country to overcome our stake inequalities and to advance the position of the poor and underprivileged? That is a major challenge. That is the challenge. I am positive that it is possible to find solutions for those uh, daunting uh, challenges. What saddens me in many respects is that we talk about the poverty, we talk about unemployment, and we also talk about the great divide between people that have and people that don't have. But we are not of one mind when we debate the solution of, of, of those problems. And unless the whole of society is not committed to finding solutions for this great divide, we will have an uphill battle to do that. That was Leon Bessel speaking to Krima Media's Polity about his book, Encountering Apartheid's Ghost, From Kukrasdorp to Constitutional Heal.